Live from Ozymandias' lair, this is Derailed Trains of Thought. Welcome, Tim. Hello. Why are we here? I don't know. I never know where the podcast is going to bring us. There's various um, story universes I really don't want to exist in. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would I would agree. Just based off all this um, surveillance footage that's on this wall of monitors over here, I do not think this is a good place for us to be. No. So. It might be a good story somewhere, but let's not be in it. Yeah. Well, at least here, I think we're safer from some of the carnage that is going on out there. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like there's some... Although if we get caught, that may be a different matter. Yeah. It might be better. Well, yeah. I don't know which way I'm going to go. He's a Gordian's not of some sort. Um, yeah. Basically. Anyways. But uh, welcome. How's well, your summer going? It's going pretty well. Kind of raining right now, but... Yeah, um, back home. Back home, yeah. Yeah, here it's kind of cold. cold. It's actually a very cold place to be for the summer. Yeah, that's true. It's, I guess a nice change for half an hour. It wouldn't hour. be It wouldn't be quite as exotic for a place if we were visiting here in the winter. Yeah, exactly. Uh, How about your, your, your summer? It's trucking along. E3 was a few weeks ago and was kind of overwhelmed with Kingdom Hearts news for so a little bit. now you're excited. I am excited, well, but also... Well, you were before. <laughs> yes, I was. And now I'm a little sad that it got pushed back like two months from when I was hoping it was going to be released. But at least there's a date now. There is a date now. As opposed to sometime. Somewhere. Yes. So it's, Wizard of Oz in Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> We're getting to the point pretty soon. I'm sort of like trying to figure out if I'm going to even try to watch any trailers come between now and then because there's only so much you want to know beforehand. And I'm like, I might be right in the threshold. The threshold of, of like cutting it. Yeah. It's cutting all ties to... Kingdom Hearts Twitter feeds and yeah. various things like that. So uh, uh, we'll see. <laughs> it's, it's only been like, you know, a 10-year wait. So everyone, in nine months, we can have a story school on Kingdom Hearts 3. <laughs> something like that. I've seriously considered taking off a day of work for it or something like <laughs> that. But at the same time, it's like, but you don't want to play through it too much because you've been waiting to, for so yeah. long. So it's like, what's the right balance? <laughs> but uh, it should be fun. All right, then. <laughs> but anyway, we're not here to talk about that yet. No, not, not today. Today, we're going to talk about story school. <laughs> I thought you were going to give it away at first. No, no. <laughs> It's still a secret until the end of our story school. No. <laughs> this topic's been on our list for a long time, and we've kind of danced around it, which is what well, was originally titled in our notes as form and function. I think it might be better as the medium and the message. Basically, the inner interrelation between how you're telling a story and what the story's about. And we've touched on this many times, I think, in to a less degree. We often said that a good story really fits well with the... Uh, what the framework of it should be. Yeah. The story should be what it should be, if that well, makes any that's sense. true, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, like, you, as you, the process of telling the story, you really understand what the story should be. But I think for this, we'll start at kind of like the 20,000... Leagues under the sea? Leagues under the sea, yeah. <laughs> Five miles high, whatever. Bird's eye view. Okay. Okay. You know, like, the big, you know, because there's a lot of mediums out there. Like, there's written word... There's comics, there's video. Fortune there's, tellers. Yes, they're that medium. mediums, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Fun times. <laughs> and I was thinking, even from, from early on in written history, they would pick the medium based on the story, in the sense that if you had a, an epic story, you wouldn't tell it normal, you'd tell it in poetry. Hmm, I see what you mean. That uh, the first message... First like, in ancient times, they probably had very limited ways they could do it. Well... What I mean is the that the the structure and the setup and the you know the stylings were dictated by what you were trying to say. If you're telling, yeah, obviously if you're just recording document lists for sales, you just do it like you always do. But if you're going to tell the history of your kingdom or of your great hero, it goes into an epic poem. You don't write it as a story; you write it as a poem because that's the medium of the poetry meets the message of the higher level of respect and well and also in some ways i wonder if it made it easier for people to memorize you know and that's right true too not not very many people could afford parchments or things like that you 
like a lot of uh, there's certain psalms that kind of recount Israel's history mm-hmm. so that people could sing it. Basically, that's true. That's true. Well, and then I mean the idea of putting noble things into poetic epic poems, you know, went all the way up through like Paradise Lost and things like that. Mm. You know, obviously it's in Beowulf and the Odyssey, and I think the Epic Gilgamesh is a poem. I don't actually know. Okay. But yeah, you get up to even more modern poets imitate that sort of idea that, mm. look, you could just tell the story of Adam and Eve normal, but wanted to kind of put in that framework that mm-hmm. was handed down from generations. Anyway, so we had written word. And it's interesting, the medium, you know, written word or video or play, or, they tend to, it, it's interesting, I was thinking about it, when they first become a thing, they tend not to be themselves. They, they tend to borrow very heavily on from the mediums something else. that have come before. Yeah, I mean, movies is easy to see that. You know, they're basically like yeah, plays. The, especially the first, some of the very early silent films mm-hmm. that uh, were more longer form were basically just, yeah, everyone was just in one scene and doing kind of one thing. I remember the playwright J.M. Barry was actually kind of disappointed when they finally did a film version of Peter Pan. And he's like, it should be something really unique, really embrace the medium. But it was basically just a, a filming of his play. Yeah. But it, it would take a while before... Uh, Everyone would have sort of the visionary of what film could do, like, say, uh, Moliere, mm-hmm. who did the, A Trip to the Moon. Yeah. And, and even in that, in some ways, was sort of like, you know, you had your sets. Each scene was sort of set. But he was very innovative because in, he was a magician before he was a filmmaker. Okay. And he wound up using a lot of just coming up with clever illusions. He was one of the first to really do some very creative edits with film, like... In a trip to the moon, they'll like uh, so a guy will hit someone with an umbrella and then they'll disappear in a puff of smoke. Yeah, that's a that's an edit. Like yeah, you, you and that was new back then. It was new. You never seen film special effects like that before. Yeah. But it was the, a very the, rudimentary thing, and uh, future filmmakers built on that to come up with all kinds of new stuff. That's a great example. And uh, you know, video games, you know, they started one way and then they move into a different media, you know, different styles and, d- and, and take vi- different different sorts of, of approaches. And so, as you get mediums, you know, you got you got your big ones, and then you have, and then everything has kind of its subcategories. You know, video has your documentary, it has your, you know, whatever. So, so like, you have your structure, you have a story, and, like, if you're on an old-school TV, you'd have six acts. Uh-huh. You know, if you play, you have three acts. If you're doing a sonnet, you have 14 lines. You have a flesh fiction, you have a thousand words. So, there's these, li- you know, sometimes the structure and the story is limited by Very the format. Very specific format yeah. settings, yeah. So, it's interesting, as a creator, how does this work? You, do you just learn a, a style, and then you just make stories that fit it, or do you find a story and then find the style that fits it? So I think that people approach it from both ways. You know, there's some people who write in lots of mediums. Mm-hmm. I think like Jaron Straczynski. He's written comic books, TV shows, movies. Books. Books. Yeah, he's um, written in all kinds of Probably formats. audio for all I know. But <laughs> So you probably just find the story and say, what's the best way to tell this? Hmm. Meanwhile, I'm like, well, I write books. so Or I write words. Mm-hmm. So Well, you've written plays and Yeah, and I'm, I'm getting better at those styles. Yeah. But you, you certainly have a, a specialty. Yeah. I guess, okay, just, we'll take, like, the flesh fiction, which I've done 120 of them now. Uh-huh. You get a thousand words. So there's certain things you won't write. Right. There's a lot of things you won't write. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of kinds of stories. Lots of kinds of stories. But you realize that you use it, there's a lot of kinds of stories you can write. And then even within that, your structure, your medium is, well, do I phrase this as, like, a comedy or a mystery or a slice of life those dictate or a myth you know those dictate even more of you know what's the purpose of the story should dictate your language dictate Hmm. you know what point of view you use that's interesting like even before you start writing i'm guessing before you start writing you probably have to go through a a set of choices first it's like okay what is this idea exactly and it's funny because i think most of these choices we're not conscious of most of them Mm -hmm. you just kind of say most things just fall into place. It's this sort of story. You just say, these things fit. Uh-huh. You ever start a flash fiction and realize, okay, this is actually way too big than what I... Yes. I mean, I, I, know, I know you've done some flash fictions just an excuse to dabble in a world that you don't have time to actually write in. Which is really, you know, I would argue not good. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's not a great use of a flash fiction, No, basically. no, then you just, yeah. But, yeah, I have a couple that I started and then I just stopped because I'm like, this, no, this is not going to work. Uh-huh. I had this one about... 
a library and I ended up, it needs to be like a 10,000 word story, you know? <laughs> it's like a mystical library and there's creatures running around it. And I mean, it ends up being very Doctor Who-ish, but I don't think it was at all inspired by that one. Uh-huh. I tell you, doing fantasy stories in a short format, I've discovered can be very difficult if you don't have the right framework. You probably remember my my story, um, oh, right, nah, I don't remember the name of my, <laughs> my story. One that I did for the story project for the short story okay. collection that was the fantasy setting. Was it the royalty? Adopted royalty Adopted one? royalty. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah that's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I went into that with the mindset of world building, you know, learning from Tolkien. Okay, I'm yeah. going to create this whole world, kind of try to base on it. But at the end, there was just, there was actually way too much stuff that I try to fit in. And it feels kind of like a very cramped sort of short story because of it. Whereas in, when I did later for the story project, I did a story called A Tale of Fairies. Yeah. That was very purposely focused it as like, okay, this is a fairy tale. I'm not explaining the entire world. I'm just kind of explaining a scenario. And that, I felt, came out much better. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things that you, it just takes some experimentation before you kind of realize that. Yeah, and, and so this interrelation between the medium and the message, the story and the structure, I think is, it's been fascinating to me because you have a story you want to tell, and you can tell the same story in lots of different ways. And it'll still be largely the same story. But if you think about and consider video versus written or long versus short or first person or third person, it changes these subtle things that if you know what your story needs to be or wants to be, can highlight or just kind of hinder. For instance, I get annoyed sometimes when I read books that feel like they're trying to be movies. Ah. You know, like it's very, everything's described very action-y and very, and like it makes a fine book, but to me it's not really what a book's about. You could tell they're trying to make it very cinematic and stuff, mm -hmm. and you're like, mm, but it's, it, you're missing something. You're missing the depth that words let you have instead of trying to imitate visual things on a, on a page. On a page. Mm -hmm. Because that sort of idea doesn't, my guess doesn't happen near as much until movies show up. Yeah, that's probably true. I mean, if you read old stuff, the way they use language, the way to describe characters and stuff is very different than we get later. Well, there's, I mean, there's a lot that's going a, into that. But. That's a general, there's a large generalization. Yeah. And it's interesting, even books we're talking about, sorry, flashback, talk about using medium. Early books were largely like letters. A lot of them were like the epistolary sort of things, like Frankenstein and Dracula. It's like they had to still base it in this sort of like, one person telling it to another like, sort like people of thing. telling stories. That's interesting. I, I not not all of them, but I mean, you see that a lot more back then. Yeah. Then now, you, I mean, there are some, but right. it's very rare. I wonder if Robinson Crusoe was kind of unusual in the day. Like, when, when did first person really start to become a thing? You know, I don't know. Because Robinson Crusoe was written a lot like a diary, if I remember right, or journals. Yeah. And see, that's a, you know, Gulliver's Travels. Uh huh. It basically imitated travel logs. Yeah. That's you know, true. it, a lot of early. Again, this is a summary, and I, English historians can probably prove me wrong, but it seems like a lot of the early stuff is basically imitating nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting because, you know, we have the same sort of thing in some of the visual formats now. You know, we'll have Cloverfield, the classic example of kind of this is a live action yeah. sort of thing. where you, all, you, Your mockumentaries, you mockumentaries know, a yeah. fictional version of, like, of a documentary. Yeah. So, yeah, we still do some of that kind of, like, telling a fictional story in a non-fictional sort of way. It, it, it's funny that that came up so, in some ways, so late in the visual medium, but I guess because plays existed. That could be. And so that was that was a blueprint for the movies probably early on, while non-fiction was a blueprint for novels. Well, it, maybe it, it took a while. Cause you had to develop the non-fiction form of visual storytelling before you could come up with a fictionalized non-fiction <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> form of storytelling. Yeah. And that it took the technology probably a while to be able to do non-fiction. Because, you know, early, like, travel logs is just basically recording sites. You know, like, World War II and, and like, Korean newsreels were very different sorts of nonfiction storytelling than later documentary styles that mm -hmm. probably would have emerged in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Just different for any and it, it takes it takes a lot of a community of storytellers basically experimenting with mm -hmm. a craft before they kind of kind of experiment and find the new ways that a medium can work. And isn't that isn't that kind of interesting actually that even like the book, the novel, you know, people would track the origin of the novel. You know, I think earliest novels in Japan or China. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we learn how to make it do different things. 
Uh-huh. We're discovering what stories work best. And, and again, there's lots of different types of stories, and we figure those out. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's interesting how elastic some of these are. While simultaneously, not all mediums are equal. Yeah. There are still fundamental differences. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, it's kind of, we've talked some of that in like our adaptation episodes and stuff like that. Right. So do you want to dive into some specific examples? We've been look, taking this kind of bird's eye yeah. view on Yeah, things. let's do some specific examples. Okay, just for fun, I'm going to start with, I think, an example of structure and story that match well from one of our favorite um, topics, which is Lost. Okay. So, but I just I didn't think I had to do it, but, okay, the flashback. Okay. So As we're, a, we're starting with TV. This, yeah. is, the, this is the medium. T- TV. Okay. So you have the, your six acts, and you got the cliffhanger thing going on, and... But the idea of the flashback as an f- essential part of each episode mm-hmm. matches the story focus of deeply character focus and being lost. Uh-huh. I mean, and I think it's just interesting. Other shows afterwards try to use a flashback, but they didn't have the, the purpose behind it. They just did it because it was cool. Okay, yeah. And Lost had a very unique reason for doing flashback because it started like there was a pivotal moment or a you yeah. know, a genesis moment or whatever you want to call it you know the plane crash yeah so then you have like this before and after the plane crash and then sometimes they would set up a new sort of pivotal yeah. moment like off the island and then when they did the flash forwards yeah. when they were off the island and then while they're on the island and, and it's very much about you're constantly looking at two people and even though it's the same character in each episode it's always like their previous version and their future version uh-huh and that was kind of the, the thematic string of Lost. Who are these people and who are they becoming? And so, it wor- you know, it was intricately tried. Doing Lost without the flashbacks isn't Lost. Yeah, that's true. Um, and every once in a while, they would switch it. Like, if they normally go back and forth, but every once in a while, they have an episode like, look, it's not worth going back and forth. We're just going to do flashback the whole time. <laughs> like with Richard Alpert episode. Mm-hmm. Um, or uh, a Desmond episode. Yeah, so they, they could would... Could be something completely different. So they would switch it when they knew it was, you know, they didn't just keep the style just... Just to have the style. St- style. And every now and then, there would be an episode that... Weren't there some episodes that were just all island, all island I action? do not know about that. Okay. I can't... I seem like they always did some sort of time thing, but I okay. could be wrong. You, you might be right there. I, I'm trying to remember if... Maybe in later seasons. And I suppose setting up all the flashbacks helps you with the whole... Swallow the whole time travel stuff later. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's such a... It's built into the cake yeah. at that point. Yeah. Now... So that's just one... I mean, that was just one example. I thought we'd use a hobby horse here real quick yeah. to start with. But uh, <laughs> the flashback, though, is not unique to television. So that's is there true. is there something about the medium of television that would, could only be done with... That Lost could only use television to tell that story? I think the way it was... It was deeply... Um, so much was implied in Faces oh, okay. and Lost. I think... It would and, not have worked as a book. And it was, so in, it was so ambiguous. Books uh, have a harder time being that ambiguous. I mean, there are books that can manage. Yeah. But it's a different sort of ambiguity. Yeah, if you had tried to be ambiguous, like lost levels ambiguous in a book, I feel like it would have come off more Hemingway. And it would have come off almost more literary than pop culture phenomena. Yeah, yeah. It would have been, it would have been hard. But you might be able to transfer some of that, but I, th- I feel like it was such a visual... The the island, the different, you know, mm-hmm. crazy things going on that you could have, yeah, you could have written a book version of it, but I think you would have lost that visceralness that mm. was half of what Lost was. That makes sense. Since we're on the TV medium, yeah. I, th- I thought of one, I think that's of, of a show, that, at least, that yeah. would works perfectly for as a TV show and probably wouldn't have worked in everything else, being almost experimental in nature, being the Jim Henson hour. Mm, yeah. Because Jim Henson grew up in television. He loved television. That was his... I mean, he made movies, too, obviously, but it was his first creative outlet. Yeah. And the Jim Henson Hour was kind of his take on the wonderful world of Disney, kind of a little variety show when no one was really doing that kind of thing anymore. Um, But it was very nice experimental. You know, you'd have... uh, Sometimes it would just be like first half is Muppet television and the second half, the the storyteller. That was kind of the, the default. But then sometimes you'd have... Something that was like, you wouldn't have to have something that was stretched the entire hour. You could do like Dog City, I think it's yeah. like 45 minutes or something like that. And I think they filled in the rest of it with a little bit of Muppet television. Yeah. So it was a very perfect sort of like outlet for any kind of creative experiment that I don't know that you could really do anywhere else. No, because you couldn't even do it like if you were doing a traveling show. Uh-huh. It, was, it, now, it wasn't it, possible in that manner either. Yeah. 
Now, I suppose in the age of the internet, it would have been a different story because online you can have videos of whatever length you want. No, that's true. Yeah, I guess I guess in the internet, and that's interesting to me. The TV as a medium has set Standard. Ta- ta- time time, time frames you have to yeah. work within. Mm-hmm. The internet doesn't. Netflix, I guess, does, but it's just left over from TV and wouldn't have to. But even that's very loose. Like it's, if, mu- it's getting looser, too, I think. You look at some of their original series, and some will be like 55 minutes, some will be 51 minutes. It'll be like yeah. they're sticking in with a traditional like hour format for most of their shows, but they have way more flexibility. I'm curious. Do you ha- have any idea? Obviously, they're doing that partly just because people are used to that mm-hmm. from TV. Do you think... That the hour isn't actually a, a good, I don't know, a good st- structure for most storytelling like that? Or is it, will they eventually say, no, actually there's a lot better. I think that's an interesting thing with medium message is like, will you find stories be like, you know what, 20 minutes or like some weird amount, like hour and a half. Uh, oh, I guess that's... um. That's kind of what Sherlock does. That's what Sherlock does. Yeah, they've decided that that's their... Yeah, Sherlock is almost a set of... Movies. TV movies, I yeah. think sometimes, almost like a mini series. They only do three episodes at a time. And I wonder, on one hand, I in, in the you know the story and the structure is that when you had say you had fifty minutes, four or five minutes for a TV show, you had to fit certain stories. I'm sure it mm. limited at some point, uh-huh. but did that limitation cause also a certain amount of creativity to keep things moving? To keep, you know. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's a back and forth. But on some things, you don't. You like, no, I need five more minutes, and then yeah. they can do it. But then I wonder if there's a temptation for creators to just do everything they want when the structure might have actually helped them hone it down. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting um, it's an interesting dichotomy there, isn't it? Because I could definitely see it both ways. I think probably the the longevity of the quote unquote hour sort of format works actually. Netflix is like 52 minute whatever. Yeah. It's actually probably more content than they actually get on traditional TV. Because I think it's like 43 or 5 now. Yeah, something like that with, with all the commercial breaks. Yeah. But I, I imagine we'll, we'll continue seeing some sort of experimentation on that format. Yeah. As television, with the online medium and all the different choices for TV nowadays, you have a lot more flexibility and willingness to experiment with that kind of stuff and i wouldn't be surprised if we see some different formats i wonder if it's like you know poetry i took a poetry class and you know you have the elegy you have the ballad and there's strict rules for all these the sonnet you know sometimes it's line sometimes rhythm Mm -hmm. but then there's free form poetry which some people love but has a lot less rules but you have the more internally structured Uh i wonder if that would be the same thing with TV is like, you know, you had these certain rules that you kind of just had because of the nature of the beast Mm -hmm. and whether we'll have free form television. I mean, some ways, I mean, right now they're still kind of held down by just the sort of rhythm of drama. Right. That is one of the other interesting things about any visual format of storytelling that time is as much a factor as the visuals or the words Mm -hmm. it's almost like you had a a third dimension to it in a sense because a painting is so that's purely visual book is mostly and you go at your own pace i mean yeah yeah but a movie you're always moving through time as you're watching it or tv show or a lot of things like that. and most people can't manage more than about three three and a half hour movie yeah (laughs) and so it's the whole like flashbacking is playing with time, you know. That's that's why time travel kind of shows are really, really, really interesting. In, yeah, in these mediums, but I'm, you, you I'm not sure where I'm di- going with that. Yeah, but, but you're right. No, that's true. That, that that's what I mean. When time is, it's a bigger deal. Yeah, and making the most of the the screen time that you have, and there's lots of different like editing tricks that you can use with the time. We've talked about time yeah. before, so I don't want to get too much into that, but. It's it's something that makes the visual f- formats, uh, moving pictures, I should say. Moving pictures, yes. <laughs> moving pictures, particularly. Uh, it's one of its unique elements yeah. for its form. Now, books, on the other hand, I, it's hard to tell. What's a good example of a book? Well, like any good book. Um, <laughs> but and there's just so many different genres. You know, they all play it different. You know, you have books that are very good at the internal character stuff, which you can't do, and we've mentioned that before, mm. in moving pictures the same way. So right. you have your, really get into the mindset of the main yeah. character. Uh, have you started the, our uh, current book club book yet? Uh, no, I, this at the library. I got to pick it up tomorrow. Okay. 
One of the things that this book does, it's called um, On the Edge of the Dark Sea of Darkness. <laughs> very kind of tongue-in-cheek fantasy at times, but also a lot very sincere sort of fantasy storytelling. Definitely, you can tell it gets some cues from Tolkien mm-hmm. and it, its style and worldview approach. But also, in some of its world building, you know, it's, it's got like three brief little prologues. <laughs> um, it's got some very brief appendices kind of stuff in the back. But one thing this one also does is it does footnotes. And the footnotes are usually like some, when some character will mention something about the culture of the world, yeah. it'll do a little footnote at the bottom telling some ridiculous story basically <laughs> about the history of that of that sport or this book or whatever. And, and we'll even like give like the citation for this fictional book, you know, that exists. And that's, I think that's a very fun use of, of a book format. Oh, yeah, exactly. And uh, fantasy world building in a way that I don't think I've seen it quite like that. I mean, we've all seen like, Fictional, you've you've got references yeah. to scholars in on the yeah. aisle, say the, such and such. Or but this, this I thought was unique for the actual book media, or the ridiculous like a Hitchhiker Guide. They'll have long asides explaining things. You uh-huh. know? Well, I, I guess I got to bring Silmarillion, things like that, where the language communicates the story in a way you could not do visually. Hmm. Mm-hmm. You know that the language is, and I think that's the thing with books we mentioned before that the language can communicate non-visual images. It didn't make any sense. <laughs> but <laughs> it, it conjures images in a very different way, in the mind's eye, as opposed to, like, yeah. when you see it on the screen, it's like, oh, that's what that is. And, and per, just a sense of personality, mm-hmm. you know, that is different, fundamentally different than you get from watching a person be a person. You know, right. you know my wife like... writing me a, some, a note is different than her telling me it. Mm, that's a good point. There's almost something more... I don't know, spiritual in a sense of, of kind of experiencing the story in your mind's eye as opposed to yeah. just, it's more vague. It's a little more mystical. Yeah. I mean, in some ways you said the words can, you can kind of really hone in on yeah. what you're trying to say as opposed to images are kind of more open to interpretation. But when you're describing something, especially in a narrative sense, you can really impart kind of a, a I don't know, there's, there's certain feelings that it can mm-hmm. uh, emote. Emote, yeah. That, uh, that are just different than when you see it on a screen. Go go back to our episode about language and words. Yeah. Yeah. Or in images. Those are fun discussions. Um, so let's take, so like, say a comic. Yes. So okay. you have both the visual uh-huh. and you have the words. You know. So it's a blending. This is actually very useful. I've been listening to the protagonist podcast, one of their most recent episodes. They did an examination of an XKCD comic. Okay. So I, I, I've had some of these thoughts come. It's like, this will fit in really well with our episode. <laughs> Um, Because they mentioned Scott McCloud's book, Understanding Comics. Yeah, which is a great book. Great, very scholarly study of the comic book format. Let's just mention that real quick. It's a comic book study written as a comic book. Yes. So it's using the medium because it's that's the message. Yes. Yeah. It's it's a perfect blend of the two. Yeah. And one of the things that Scott McCloud says in that book, basically even trying to define what the comic book format is or visual novel or whatever you want to call it, it's like, well, it's a se- sequence of images. But it's like, well, I guess you could say movies are a sequence of images telling a story too, yeah. right? So a comic book is a series of still images that may also convey movement, but you know, spread yeah. on a page, basically. But I don't think this got into that book, but Scott McCloud later said that web comics kind of provide an infinite canvas for that, and that a regular comic book artist is limited by the boundaries of the page. Okay. On a computer screen, you don't have those boundaries. No. So what, some web comic artists have done some really interesting experimental things with that. Order of the Stick is one. There was a particular moment when a protagonist got to... Uh, blasted off a dragon. He was mm-hmm. fighting a lich that was riding a dragon, fantasy yeah. comic. Um, and so and the, the next day's strip or whenever it came out is the character basically falling through the air and it's this one, instead of it being this normal like three panel la- yeah. layout sort of thing, it was one long panel that you basically scrolled down the webpage as he was falling. Yeah. So you sort of got the same impression of the character falling and he's like trying to figure out how to save himself. See, that's a great use of mediums heightening what the story's about. Yeah, it was very unique and made it all the more shocking when he basically crashed into the ground at the end and died. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert, but it's an old strip. But then, you know, then you would try to put that in a book, and they probably tried. It's not the same thing. It wouldn't be, yeah. Well, there's some brawl in the family that's like that. I mean, most of it goes in a book form fine, but 
Uh-huh. You got their musical comics. And he's like, well, you'll have to like lis- turn on your MP3 player and listen to this while you read this book. And it, yeah. you can do it, but it, it's much more simpler to do it on a computer screen. And the XKCD comic they were talking about was this experiment called Time, where the creator basically updated. So, you know, each comic on the thing has its own web page. Yeah. Well, the web page for this one changed like once every half hour or once every hour and basically told a, it was basically an animation over a long period of okay. time. Yeah. And it wound up like, I don't know how many, wound up being like thousands of panels long, but it's all, it was all on the one page. Now you can go, they've got it all compiled and you can kind of scroll through it. But okay. it was an interesting experiment in the day because at first everyone was like, what is this? This isn't really a, it wasn't really a funny panel. It was just some people building a sandcastle is how yeah. it started off. And each time you'd see, they'd come back, it'd be a little bit different, a little bit different. So <laughs> again, experimenting with the format. Yeah. And there's a way that you're using that infinite canvas to bring in that time exactly. aspect. Yeah. Yeah. And it's fascinating. And it's like, it's free form comic. Yeah. <laughs> Which is interesting. Like I was thinking about Charles Schultz with peanuts. He was, and I don't know if this is just the way the comic medium was, was going at the time or it was just restrictions that, uh, were opposed on him, but he perfected the four panel sort of layout. Yeah, I, I think the amount of meaning that he could do in just four basic panels was pretty remarkable storytelling. Yeah, but then later on, you get someone like Bill Watterson and saying comics should be so much more than just this. And he demanded when once Calvin and Hobbes was successful enough, he basically negotiated to have much longer Sunday yeah. pages than anyone else was doing. Well, and then I mean, talking comic strips. Um, Gary Larson perfected the one panel joke. Yeah. I mean, it takes a lot of work to have a f- laugh out loud, funny one panel thing. Mm-hmm. And he was very good at it. Yeah. <laughs> Far side. If you, that's who, Gary Larson. Um, if you haven't read Far Side, guys, go, go hunt it down. It is, <laughs> it is fabulous. But it, I think it's remarkable how you, again, different creators, different expectations that working very specifically with the one-one form or trying to break down the boundaries and make new forms. Well, and, and the thing largely, these are all creators, I think, who said, here's a story I'm trying to tell. What's the best way for me to tell it? Hmm. Probably Charles Schultz was like, I got four panels. I'll learn to tell the best story possible. Uh-huh. Bill Watterson might have been the sort of guy saying, I have this story. Give me the panels I need. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I mean, I could see from my understanding the two of them, uh-huh. I could see that. And I think, you know, and you come from from both ways, you know, there's stories in my head like, well, I need to write this. And there's other ones like, I'm trying to write a fly fiction, like, what will fit here? Mm. But you, the two have to interrelate one way. I mean, you could just tell a story in whatever they give you, but that's not the best use of your creative powers. Yeah. Although sometimes if that's, <laughs> obviously we're not making a living off of our storytelling, so yeah. we can, can, can do whatever. If you, that is your your medium, there's a certain amount of like, you have to obey the rules of oh. the people who are paying you. Oh yeah. No, what I mean though is that you always have to have some sort of, in your mind, what is my story I'm trying to say? What do, what are my limits? Mm-hmm. Or what, how am I telling it? Now, if you can't change how you're telling it, you might have to change your story. Yeah. Or, or at least, save, that, or, or, or save a, that story for something or else. Or aspects of the story, tell it, have a different focus than you thought you were going to have. Mm. But if you can change the medium, then maybe you have more freedom to tell different types of stories. That's very interesting. It is. And, and nowadays, we probably have more medium opportunities than, than ever. ever. I mean, when we did Story Project, we were basically like, I don't know if we invented, but we were, we had never seen basically, hey, it's real time journal storytelling yeah blogs basically well it was fictional blogs which yeah. was a thing back then but much was, more so than that now nowadays blogs are more like more like columnists is yeah. what blogging is really more like these days but, as but, opposed to back when it was like the instagram of the day and we figured out how you know we early ones we hadn't quite figured out what this fictional blog thing was yeah eventually it became a little bit more less like something a person would actually write and more like just kind of brief segments Brief chapters of a story from people's point of view. Yeah, and, yeah. It, and, it, and it was it had this time, you know, had this. It's almost epistolary. That's sense true. To it, actually. Yeah. I mean, you could only tell that story the way we've told it in that medium. Yeah, that's true. I, I like that about that. I mean, you could retell. It. I've thought about it, but it would be a very different beast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. You take the characters and tell a different sort of story, mm-hmm. which could be cool. Could but... be cool, but it wouldn't be the same. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. All right. So, anyways, that was kind of our uh, musings on how medium and messages move together. And I guess next time you watch something really interesting or a movie you really like, just think about 
this fits, you know, whether it's the Watchmen in the graphic novel format or Star Wars in the visual format or whatever. Yep. All right. That's all I've got. Okay. I mean, I don't say that often enough. <laughs> all right. So let's go to soundtrack. Okay, so this soundtrack, this one, I, I, I feel like it, it follows the format and breaks the format simultaneously because, so this is a remix of Crazy Motorcycle from Final Fantasy VII, but it's done a cappella. The original Crazy Motorcycle song is like high speed techno y kind yeah. of stuff, chase sort of music. This is an a cappella version. <laughs> so it's kind of breaking the mold of what it's usually done. But it was done that way based off a Kickstarter prompt who basically requested Crazy Motorcycle plus a song from a game called Crazy Bus that I never heard of. Which is ridiculous, yeah. Um, in a cappella style. So, yeah, so you put the a cappella, so it has to become a very different beast right. than it, Crazy Motorcycle would have been. Yes. And uh, apparently the guy who, did the, who actually did the remix, Expert Novice, said, whichever Kickstarter backer from Final Fantasy VI requested this, I hate you. I hate <laughs> everything you stand for. Because <laughs> he knew he was he was creating a monster. And when I heard this, it's like, we're putting this on the podcast somehow. I don't care how we <laughs> fit it in. We're going to use this. It is fabulous. So I hope you enjoy. If I were in a motorcycle sound like this doom doom motorcycle doom 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 chase doom doom motorcycle doom 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 chase second that's not a motorcycle that's a crazy bus <laughs> I love that song. <laughs> <laughs> it is a uh, crazy bus journey. Yes. <laughs> my kids love that song as well, but for good reason. Oh, uh, my wife does not, <laughs> 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 because I played it like way too many times. One day, she's like, "Enough." <laughs> so, anyways, oh, that's that's amazing. Let's go to. What if? This topic is just asking for a what if. It really is. And in fact, we actually did ask about what ifs. Yes. We've tried to start doing a thing on our Twitter account called What If Wednesdays. Yes. We're not quite consistent every week yet, but we're getting there. No, and I, I'm sorry. I meant to post another question for this 
like yesterday, um, but I forgot. So, yeah, right. so what if this time when you talk about, hey, something's made really well for this particular style. What if we made it something else? Now, this happens all the time with movies and stuff, but we were going to go a little crazier. But it's like, what if Star Wars was the Shakespearean play? Oh, we, we've done that. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> well, we didn't do this, but they actually have published a book on it. And, and it highlights different stuff. And it, it is pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, it definitely brings out some of the classical traits of Star Wars by doing that. So the question I asked on Twitter was uh, what if your favorite video game was adapted as a TV show? Would it work at best as an anime or something else? And we got a couple of responses. Greg, who was a guest not too long ago, said, I would make a sports show about Blitzball from Final Fantasy X. He said, with the events of Final Fantasy X taking place entirely in the background, and has never referenced much either other than an offhanded comment by one of the players. That would be completely awesome, actually. That would, that would, I think that would be, be really cool. kind of cool. Yeah. Because then it'd be like hardcore, like, Sports source show or sports anime, even I don't know. And but. honestly, it would probably look a lot more convincing as a sport than it does in the game. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a, the game mechanics as a video game are a little awkward, at least of the from the PS2 era. It'd be interesting to remake Blitzball in modern style and like make it less turn based, which didn't make a whole lot of sense for a sports mini game. So that actually would be a, probably what you said, like an improvement of Blitzball for one. <laughs> yes, I think it probably would. So and then Nathan, our frequent guest and friend, said. Her frequent friend? <laughs> friend and frequent guest uh, said uh, Mega Man, or Me because I guess that's his favorite yeah. uh, video game series. I don't know. I'd be curious if Final Fantasy X is Greg's favorite video game. Hmm. Now, um, Mega Man's been in cartoon before. It probably has. No, I, I know it has. Oh, and he said that's been an animated series a few times. I could also see it working as a CW style superhero show, an Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. esque action series on robots and AI. Uh, there could even be a Mega Man X spinoff, which could be darker than time travel shenanigans crossovers. <laughs> so, so that would be interesting because I mean, obviously, Mega Man, if you do the cartoon, ha you know, has a very blue kind of would be a very look. anime kind of vibe. I'm sure yeah, that's probably. But if you make it like, say, done. you made it turn to TV, say you'd make it even CW ish, live action, live action. Mm. You'd have to. It's like they do with movies now. You'd turn down some of the cartooniness. Yeah, I mean, not, CW only does it half as much as some yeah, not things. not quite as bright colors and stuff like that. Just the it's a nice balance they do. I think the costumes definitely look a little more realistic, but they also look a lot flashier than I don't know. They, some some of the superheroes just like I'm going to put them in black. Yeah, like Smallville for example. Mm -hmm. At least early Smallville. I, there's a lot of Smallville I haven't seen. Or like but. the like the X Men movies. Like yeah, they basically strip them from any actual. Of their iconic looks. Just put them in uniforms. Yeah. Yeah. So, Tim, shall we take some of these on ourselves? Yes. So what's uh, what's an interesting medium or story that we could transfer to another medium? And the thing is, we've got to do it in a... you got to really make it hard because otherwise it's just is our adaptation. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, and oh, we turned Mary Poppins into a play. Yeah. It's cover us. <laughs> um, we turned Newsies into a play. Yeah. Things that have actually already been done. So let's take something like, okay, let's take, for instance, my kids and I just watched the Muppet movie. Okay. Very Muppety movie. Very Muppety movie. I mean, it's, it's made for the Muppets. Did they enjoy it? Ray more than Fio feels like, I don't want to watch this movie. <laughs> he was just in the mood. Uh, but, um, so obviously you don't want to trans transfer it to, say, a play or TV, because it's just, it's kind of the same deal. So you got to do, I think we got to make it a written medium. Well, the, it did have an actual, like, storybook sort of. But it came with pictures and things like that. There was an official movie storybook for the Muppet movie. Oh, was there? Yes. I don't remember if I have it. I might have it somewhere. But what if we made it into, like, a myth? <laughs> okay. So, like, what would you do if it was, like... So like an epic poem sort of thing? Yeah. Like the, the, an Odyssey? The Odyssey it, or wait, Beowulf or... Uh -huh, it means a hero's true. journey anyways. It is. It is. How would you do... How would the humor translate, though? Well, see, that's the trick. Because the problem is the humor is very... Well, a lot of it's visual or uh -huh. very pun humor based. <laughs> True. But you put it into an epic poem. Obviously, you could you could you could beat up the epic poem to make it. Yeah. Pun, like you do like a mock version. Mock, of, yeah, yeah. But what if you made like you know you had to say this is going to be a legit like this is our history of our tribe. I feel like the uh, 
the flights of Gonzo would be a oh grand. Part that of would it. be awesome. The flight of Gonzo would be genius. <laughs> well, and then like instead of the movie scene, movie theater beginning, you'd almost be a whole like uh, you know gather around my the children. muses and stuff. You know, like uh, gather around and come listen to the song of your ancestors. Put down your boomerang fish and your exploding. Yeah, uh, <laughs> actually, this is kind of. But what do we do? And the thing is, the songs would uh-huh. be just. I mean, they'd have to be reworked a little bit, but you're already in poetry. Mm-hmm. I mean, so you can just rejigger them. The cameos basically just die off. I mean, yeah, I don't think the cameos would fit in anyway. That wouldn't make any kind of sense. No. But you do have this journey. You do have the main villain. Kermit's kind of the everyman sort of characters, humble origins. And you can give everyone and you know long you know genealogies and stuff if you want. You know what? It might wind up being more like rather than being the Odyssey, it might be more of a Chaucer Chaucer's Tales sort of thing. Okay. Is that what oh it's no, called? you know what? Now that'd be interesting, like on Canterbury Tales. Canterbury Tales. That's what I'm thinking. Well, now that'd be interesting because then you could almost have individual stories uh-huh. as they're going on. Yeah, can, and and some of those are very humorous. Yeah, and I, I guess I was thinking of that because you know you have your character archetypes in each one of those. You basically you you would fit Fozzie and Gonzo and Miss Piggy into these sort of like archetypal well, and you forms. and you keep. The puns and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because and from my understanding, if I remember right, from the Canterbury Tales, each poem's written in kind of a different meter style to match the yeah. character. Mm-hmm. So that could be really fun with Gonzo's versus like Fozzie's would be very bad joke ish. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, versus Miss Piggy's would be way over the top, and glamorous, glamorous, and, and animals would just be like a lot of like three word sentences or so. So this is, this is our one of our episodes for mentioning other podcasts. The Muppet fan site Tough Pigs is doing a Muppet movie podcast now where they go through the movie. Each episode dissects two minutes of the Muppet movie at a time, Yeah, uh, which is a lot of fun. But their discussion of uh, Never Before, Never Again definitely made me, gave me a greater appreciation for the ridiculous poetry of that song. <laughs> Miss Piggy is so over the top in some of her descriptions of the grandeur of their love that would fit in perfectly with this sort of thing. Man, that... All right. <laughs> that would be good. So the Muppet movie as uh, as Canterbury Tales. I, yeah. I, I kind of like, I, I was very skeptical at first, but put in the right context, I think it could really work. All right, Tim, you pick a pick a story. And I think we won't, we might not need to even adapt it. Maybe we're going to say, hey, we're going to change the, the structure. Like it's going to go into a serialized version or it's going to go into a half hour when mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. our mockumentary style version of something. Inception as a TV show. Inception as a TV show. Okay. So like an ongoing, like a Netflix, like it has one season or like it wants to go on as long as possible. Um, I would say a little bit of both. Okay. So I'm thinking more like network show, but one that's trying to be sort of an X-Files or a Lost sort of thing that they're not as concerned about going on forever, but they're definitely looking for like a good five now, or six seasons. Now, does Inception exist or it only exists in TV format? Like- like is this an a adaptation of the movie? No, not so much that. Is like, is it jumping off the movie or is it just fresh from? Let's say it's just fresh, but I think that I makes it harder. Just go, f- yeah, just go fresh. Like so, basically, you wouldn't necessarily even needs all the characters from Inception. Yeah, because you want to keep that. You want to keep that whole ending ambiguous. So you don't. You definitely wouldn't really want to follow up to that movie. No. So the but this movie doesn't exist. It's just the ideas of Inception. The ideas of in- Inception. Well, I guess if you okay, so if the movie doesn't even exist, I guess basically it's a series long sort of search for because let's see for his wife. Yeah, well, either a search. I mean, for that his that wife. would be his the main character's ongoing angst would be trying to find his wife. I mean, that might yeah. not be each episode, but that would be kind of the the arc that pushes you know, him. It's been a long time actually since I've seen Inception, so I'm trying to remember now because he's trying to get back to his family, right? Oh, his family, yes, because his wife is already dead, but. Do we know that the dream the still the dream's still in the isn't she still in the dream world? She's still in the dream world. Ah, oh, it's been too long. I need to watch that movie again. But no, because he wants to go back to his children, but he can't yet. Because I th- I think because he's I think he's under suspicion for killing her. Maybe. Or is it just because he's a a dream con sort of thing? I can't remember. So. Man, sorry guys. Yeah, so but the, that concept of the whole dream caper sort of thing. So you could either do sort of the crime drama thing. Uh huh. Where you're constantly using dreams to... I think it'd be fabulous to bring back the uh, Mission Impossible kind of format. Where okay. each episode is its own caper, essentially. Now, not all of them be inceptioning, because that's when you put the idea in. Right. Sometimes it's about taking it, stealing taking an idea, idea out. Stealing that would be a lot... 
a lot yeah. easier. Yeah. But maybe maybe there's a a long arc of trying to get this. I don't know. But so yeah, you need a team. Mm-hmm. You know that I'm thinking about it though. Maybe this really does make more sense for a Netflix show because I feel like commercials would really interrupt the rhythm of a dreamlike Inception experience. Well, well, but let's say we have to put commercials in, okay, just to make it hard. (laughs) So what do you do? I mean, do you just... When you have commercials, you have basically six acts. Uh And you have to have some sort of cliffhanger at the end of each one. So obviously it would matter on each episode, but... Okay, so Inception is all about dreams. Uh Uh-huh. So do you have sort of whole sections that are dream, you know, you kind of alternate them generally? Like you have act one is... Real world. Real act, world, and you have dreams. in the dream, and then maybe you're going back and forth with like the people who are inside the dream and the people who are outside. Maybe. Like sort of safeguarding. I mean, the, obviously, depending on the episode, might, you, might want to inter, you might want to just intercut them more often. Yeah. Or um, maybe some episodes you don't show the outside of the dream world much at all. Yeah. Man, you could get some really interesting, though. Some people wind up having really... Like really abstract kind of dreams, and because most of the time in Inception, the dream worlds are kind of are a little bit more realistic in some ways, and sometimes dreams really yeah. are. It that would be a really interesting format because obviously the movie set up to play on one idea and just keep pushing and pushing it. Mm-hmm. But you have a TV show; you won't have to do all the download in in the first half hour. You could unwind. This whole technology. Uh-huh. And honestly, in a TV show, they'd probably give a lot more explanation about how the technology came apart mm-hmm. and a government agency. I mean, that was just, that wasn't part of the uh-huh. movie. But in a TV show, you, will, you would dig into that sort of stuff. You know, you were talking about how could we in- involve the commercial format. I, I, I think you could do some very clever sort of meta kind of stuff with this. Maybe if like one of the people you were going into was a TV executive or something. That- and like basically, he's dreaming about the actual commercials for the show. <laughs> and because I think you'd have the team, you would. I think you'd be a lot less focused. I mean, obviously, the dream mechanics would be still interesting, but I think it would get lot, much more um, scientific. Mm. You know, you'd have a lot more of it. Get a lot more funky because that seems to happen in TV format mm-hmm. a lot of times. I feel. I feel like it gets. And maybe it's just a way to kill time, but they they really tend to devote a lot of time to this sort of, the, especially any sort of crime drama procedure. Yeah. They, they spend a lot of time kind of connecting the dots. I don't know. If that's so. I have a feeling it'd, it'd be interesting to compare. I'm sorry, this is a complete side tangent. Yeah. I'd, I'd be very curious if that's different between like cop movies and cop TV shows. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because obviously both you have to connect the dots of the crime in each each thing, but they. It'd be interesting to do a comparison of the two. I think it would be a much more character-focused thing, just because you have to keep it going, and you yeah. have a, you would have a lot more background. Yeah, and a lot less With each of the characters on the team. Yeah, and a lot less of I mean maybe finale, but you would it wouldn't have I I think you'd lose some of that oomph you get watching it when you have three layers. You just don't have the time. Yeah, yeah, you couldn't do that or the resources to do some of the scenes he does. Right. Oh yeah, some of the the big sort of production things mm-hmm. like. The whole battle on the cliffside, or so, so it would be a in, it would be snow. a very intriguing TV show, but it would be a lower scale intriguing. Yeah, it'd be like the clever conceit that we're going to work forever until we run out of seasons. Yeah, it, it might wind up being that sort of thing. Instead. Unless it's Netflix, and then you have a season. Yeah, I don't know what sort of ongoing because I was thinking when they were like be kind of aiming for like six or seven seasons, they would have like some sort of core arc. But I'm not sure. I guess the the chasing after the wife, but you have to come up with. A long sort of conspiracy about why he can't get to. Well, her. you probably you probably do the whole with that, and then you maybe you only have one layer, and then season two or end of season one, you discover you go two layers in, yeah, and then maybe time passes, or you know, or and maybe there's a whole season where it's stuck in the dream world for a half a season. That'd be a oh, that'd be a great like season cliffhanger, like if one of the characters is stuck in the dream world, yeah, because you know, that's that's always a danger they run into. They can't get a character out, and then you th- and then you, by season four or five, you throw them into space and you move them closer. <laughs> So like their body is like going near the speed of light, so that though they're stuck in the dream world, they're not aging at all. <laughs> you know what would happen? What? What? That they would eventually go into space. Yeah. If you went enough if enough seasons, it would happen. And then you have a crossover with Interstellar. Ex- yeah. There we go. <laughs> okay. So yeah, we can that, do that. That's fun stuff. All right. What if we take? So we've adapted a. We talked a little bit about adapting a video game into a TV show. We talked about adapting a movie into an epic poem. Yeah. And then a movie into well another TV show. What if we do like a some comic strip? Okay. I mean they've done this, but so take a maybe a comic strip into a novel. 
into a novel. Because okay, l- I don't think I've ever. That's that's. We've never done never that. Seen. They've done movies because done it's movies. visual, but something. Yeah. So like you know, take Far Side. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what sort of what sort of novel do you make out of Far Side? Um, I, I've read some scattered Far Side strips, but I don't know that there's any recurring characters. There, are, there think. are recurring themes. Okay. I mean, you'd almost have to build it around. You'd almost have to build like this. Next by Michael Crichton, I read one time. It's about Gen X, and it really was ended up being more like a series of plot lines about Gen X that vaguely interrelated. Okay. It was almost like exploring the consequences of things as opposed to like a normal story. I mean, there were there was a story, but it was. Uh huh. So I wonder if you took the far side and you have okay, so you have the talking cows, uh-huh. you have prehistoric man, you have ugly women, men married to each other. And some crazy scientists. And what uh, if you have all these characters, right? Okay. You have their own plot lines. And it, it'd have to be wacky. I mean, it'd have to be like yeah. like a Hitchhiker's, Hitchhiker's Guide esque. Yeah. Uh-huh. But it wouldn't be at all really. I mean, you'd get some character based stuff just because you would have to. Uh-huh. But I don't think it'd be deeply character oriented. It'd just be idea. It'd like almost be like scenes would be setups for gags. Uh huh. It'd be really weird. That'd be... I'm not sure I've read anything. I mean, Hitchhiker is the closest thing I can think of. Or possibly some scenes from Princess Bride. I mean, and the trickiest thing would be coming up with, so these character archetypes that you've just seen, but a continuing story for a bunch of them. Yeah. And, you, which I don't think Farsight ever pff, really did. No. I mean, I, I think you could probably read enough of them to get sort of, there's archetypes, and then just connect the archetypes together. You know, you got the explorers on the river, and you almost string together you'd almost have to take archetypal stories Mm -hmm. anyways from other places and put them in so what's the connecting thread in next that that ties all is there like a theme sort of that ties all this together see if there's a theme in the comics it's largely science okay i mean they're usually making fun of pop culture and science i mean he has a lot of animal humor or you know Mm -hmm. natural world sort of yeah. stuff that this eating that and yeah so your main character would almost have to be like some sort of scientist and his family exploring things the strange world the strange worlds that you see beneath you know the cows that come awake at night and have parties or <laughs> this, you know the snakes that have yeah i don't you could do it but it'd be like super avant-garde mm-hmm. <laughs> like vignette ish very strange animal is what it sounds like yeah, it would almost have to be... I mean, you could make a collection of flesh fictions, maybe. Okay. So that um, might be a better fit for that the That might format. be a better... I like mean, but if we're trying to make it into a novel... Yeah. That's a whole different issue. Yeah. And you'd, you'd have to create a character and a plot line. Uh-huh. Neither of which exist in... In Farsight. In Farsight. <laughs> so that's... Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that one... You might be able to catch some of the flavor, but it would be a very different beast. Yeah. Maybe too much of a different beast. Yeah. Hitchhiker-ish would be the best I can come... Okay. All right. You want to do one more or not? Uh, if we can keep it. Turn something into a video game? Okay. Yeah, I don't think we've 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 gone that direction. So, like, you want to turn, like... Um, Pride and Prejudice. Pride and Prejudice is a video game. Okay, let's do it. So, I, th- I feel like either... So, is this like, like, a, is this like a dating sim? That's what, kind of what I was thinking, <laughs> actually. A dating simulator. <laughs> visual novel sort of thing. We're basically, you know, if you don't know what a dating simulator is, basically you have a, a single location. I've never played one of these, yeah. actually, so I, I don't know a whole lot about yeah. them. I'm just going from what I've seen. Like, usually it's set like at school or something, and you you get to interact with other characters, and then they'll have different, kind of choose your own adventure, different responses that you can give and the conversations yeah. you have. And basically, if you give the right response, basically you're trying to woo someone by doing the most savvy so thing. Would that, or, so, I mean, would we be able to keep, we've been talking medium message, would we be able to keep the heart of Pride and Prejudice by da- turning into dating sim? Uh, see, I'd, maybe not, because I think part of the whole pro- process with a dating sim is the flexibility of it. You know, winding up with whichever character you, you want to yeah. wind up with. Um, well, I guess you could end up with Bingley or... The other guy. Uh, yeah, I mean, if if you have if you've always had a fan, sh- if you've already always shipped two characters and never had gone together, that would be perfect for it. But I'm not sure Jane Austen would approve no. this sort of I, transfer. I wonder if you could do a sort of a uh, Harvest Moon style. Okay, like I mean, you do in your family, whatever your family stuff needs done. Like you have to knit so many things and bug your dad so often, and all this like stuff. A, and then you can also go into town and make relationships. 
see that that's, that feels a little bit more resource heavy a, a farming simulator sort of thing maybe maybe more like a point and click sort of thing oh like a puzzle sort of thing like to get to the next i could see i mean interactive fiction worked great probably for it yeah but probably. but that's not i guess the problem here with all this is that it's such a relationship heavy yeah, book. The 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 goals of the protagonist and the goals of the player for the goals of the player to meet the goals of the protagonist, it almost have to be a relationally sort of thing like a dating sim. But it'd be a little different in that you would be very purposely the game would maybe not have as many options for you to get to the right ending. Unless you have bad ending. Unless there's bad ending. It's like <laughs> it could be like Chrono Trigger and the future refused to change. <laughs> but yeah, because I mean, I suppose you could have multi. You could have multiple characters. You have all the different people. Maybe your goal is to get Elizabeth. I mean, you could like move the characters around mm-hmm. so that like, oh, it's um, what's her sister that marries Bingley? Yeah, I, I don't know the and st- the character. Mr. Collin, well, what, what you know, you no, it'd be great. You hear you, you do a dating simulator. You uh-huh. don't do it from her point. Do it from Mr. Collins' point of view. <laughs> so he's desperately trying to get a date. The dating simulator is you're the dad trying to get you all your daughters. <laughs> oh, married. that's even better. Yeah. <laughs> so you're trying. Yeah, you're the dad. The, the dad trying to get all your daughters married off. There you go. That's You've perfect. done it. <laughs> We've done it. We've that, made it to a video game. That, that's how it would work. <laughs> all right. Well, we don't need to talk anymore. We, we have to work out a little logistics, but we have the female gamers now. I, I'm surprised that's not a thing yet. Actually, now the more I think about that. That'd be hilarious. You'd have all these conversation trees, and it'd be like, the, I don't know. The way to win is to get all your daughters married, and the bad ending is if you don't get them. Or, I mean, you could have, like, me and they all get married to the wrong guy. Yeah. You could still, like, you know. <laughs> oh, I, I love it. And, like, all the characters would have different levels of prejudice and pride that you could follow. You know, so you could just, uh-huh. you, you could. See, that's where I thought you were going at first. So, I, I, again, I don't. My Pride and Prejudice, I think I've actually only watched through the whole story like maybe once. See, I've read it even. Have you? Wow. You, you definitely get the, uh, the, the brownie the, points. The, 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 bo- the bonnet novel points for the day. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say like the plus one with Natasha points or no, something okay. like that. But. Well, it was famous and I wanted to read it since it had that, you know, there was like the famous opening line. And exactly, the, the, you'd miss, well, you could transfer in a video game since it has language and voice acting. Mm-hmm. You, could, you could transfer some of the snark. Okay. Which would be nice, because that's, you know, one that's redeeming characteristics. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. Anyways, let's end up. So that was uh, that what was if. our what if. Yeah. Uh, if you enjoyed that, be sure to follow us on Twitter. We're going to try to do more what if Wednesday things. And We'd love to hear from you. You guys do good stuff. Yeah, yeah. join the conversation. It's, uh, we appreciate all of you who uh, tweet back to us. I feel like since we started our Twitter, we've gotten more feedback through Twitter than we ever did with our email address. Yeah. But if you st- prefer email address, that's still available for you at derailtrains at gmail.com. You subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, uh, join our website, derailtrainsofthought.blogspot.com. Thank you, those of you who have left ratings for us on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate it. If uh, you want to also leave a review, you know, actually talking about how weird we sound, it um, doesn't matter as long as it's like generally positive. It's, uh, <laughs> We, we don't care if you make fun of us. Yes. Also, listen to our weekly hijack, or our weekly podcast that we're going through Babylon 5 currently. Yep. Um, As of this recording, we are uh, releasing in the middle of releasing season two. Yep. The it's Coming a lot of fun. Shadows. Even if you've never watched it, it's just kind of fun to listen, I think. Yep. And it's designed to work for newbies or old comers. Yep. Old, yes. Old comer. Old. Where, yeah. Because probably if you've watched Babylon 5 before, you're old. Like us. <laughs> Which you can now watch on Amazon Prime. That's right. Amazon Prime, finally, it's on one of the major uh, streaming sites. Yes. You'll understand 50% more podcasts if you watch it. <laughs> we, we used to mention it quite a bit. Yes. Well, we've branched out for one thing in our references, but also I think we've been trying not to talk about Babylon 5 yeah. as directly. I thought about mentioning um, the ISN episode for a message in Medium. Oh, that's be true. That, anyways. We'll That'll be coming up on the Weekly Hijack soon enough. Good. All right. For our last soundtrack of the day, I really didn't know where to go with it, so I'm like, okay, there's, there's this game called Parappa the Rapper. Mm-hmm. I've never played it, but I'm like, okay, you're, you're going to remix something called Parappa the Rapper, you should rap. And I have a remix it does. It's a, like one of the earliest rhythm games, and like they'd be rapping, and you'd have to hit the buttons at the right beats and whatever. It was really unusual. I've, and the I've, style is very strange. Yeah, I, I've seen a little bit. I was like, this is different. 
But I thought we'd put a, a, a rap song on because... We've never, never done not. that on yeah, the podcast I don't before. think we have. So this is called Cooking with Fire, remixed by Navi. And that's all we've got. And we should get out of here. Hey, listen. I guess you're right. <laughs> that's my Navi joke. That, that's very nice. <laughs> all right. I get but, the link. But yes, I, I agree. There seems to be a scuffle going on in the next room. They're dressed weird and I don't even want to deal with it. Yeah. No, there's, I've, I'm seeing... Yeah, I think there's just bad things going on right now. All around, yeah. The times they are changing. Yeah, that they are. All right, but uh, hope you enjoy this... Uh, podcast. <laughs> this podcast is <laughs> Nick's rapping soundtrack. Adios. And farewell. This is Tim. This is Nick. Bye. Adios. Again. Bye. <laughs> At a young age, cooking with kerosene, pan-fried apple green recipes and magazines. Top chef before home ec, developed his own tech to keep the dough fresh and keep the flow wet and keep the stove running. Deliver hot wraps, had to preheat the oven. Word got around, other chefs were summoned, but someone stole the whole book and left the kid with nothing. He got jaded fast, first showcase might have been the last forecast. Icy fire's not pretty if it leads to meltdown in the chocolate city. But it's all in your mind Chop that beat, make a mint, rewind Fry those rhymes, saute that spinach It's all in your mind, souffle these critics Cause it's all in your mind Chop that beat, make a mint, rewind Fry those rhymes, saute that spinach It's all in your mind, souffle these critics Rematch, they all went livid Back on the scene, no props or gimmicks Or obnoxious microwave toxic dinners It's the whole food certified slop apprentice Lines so sweet they could drop a dentist Homebrew king when he topped the Guinness Whoa, stop a minute He's skipping through his life in that old kitchen pu 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 push to the limit He let that percolate Made a new track, wasn't worth the plate Behind his back, new beef and grease steaks Hot shot foes, saw time to hate Caught him at a demo of a kid's who blade Way late, a salt and pepper spray Took the bread made plus the grade A green That he grew with his hands and the money he saved But it's all in your mind Chop that beat, make him hit rewind Fry those rhymes, saute that spinach It's all in your mind, souffle these critics Cause it's all in your mind Chop that beat, make him hit rewind Fry those rhymes, saute that spinach It's all in your mind, souffle these critics they found him bleeding, stewing in the kitchen, boiling pot steaming, hand on a whetstone, blade tip gleaming, hurt me, I'm gonna cold turkey these demons, seething, not seen clearly, nearly, poisoned the fan with his hands so filthy, the bad boy of culinary sciences, went and trashed all his appliances. It went south, lost all the hype Numbness and gout from the stove won't light Can't taste now, so he rots and waste Took his name off the menu, top slot, disgrace Moved for a change of pace, ditched the rhyme book Didn't even try it as an amateur line cook Ten years drank, beer sank into misery Fake out, take out, Shawshank imagery To one day and he's old and gray That scar on his tongue long faded away So he tries to spray, surprise when it sizzles Like, kid, I missed you uh, Cause it's all in your mind Air out the fridge and the light will shine Maybe one more time he can spin those tables Just another homebrew fable But it's all in your mind